Welcome to our third 2020 MITE Low Carbon Energy Center webinar, coming to you from virtual MIT scattered across Massachusetts. I'm Robert Stoner, the Deputy Director of MITE for Science and Technology, and I'll be your moderator today. Our intention in presenting these webinars is to cover a range of topics drawn from ongoing work in all of MITE's low carbon energy centers, and a few drawn intentionally from outside them. We want you to know what we're up to at MIT and what we think is especially interesting and important as we work toward a globally decarbonized energy system. And because we want to engage and hear from you, we're presenting live. And we'll reserve time at the end of the session for your questions. You can pose your questions anytime in the Zoom webinar format. Just type your question after clicking Q&A at the bottom of the screen and you'll see it. We understand that not everyone will be able to view us live. And so as usual, we will be recording this webinar so that it can be viewed offline and shared with colleagues. Please feel free to share it. Our subject today is carbon capture. It's hard to overstate just how important carbon capture is to a low carbon future, almost any low carbon future that one can imagine. Whether we're talking about capturing carbon emissions from the flue gases of coal or natural gas fired power plants, or from power plants fueled with biomass, or the tailpipes of cars and trucks, or from the air, we need technologies that can be deployed in a wide variety of situations at low cost and massive scale that capture CO2. We may put that CO2 into the ground, convert it into new materials, or transform it into fuels to be recycled over and over again through the atmosphere. Whatever the pathway, effective means of capturing carbon are the indispensable tool. Our speaker today is Alan Hatton the Ralph Lando Professor of Chemical Engineering at MIT, and the long-serving director of the David H. Koch School of Chemical Engineering Practice. Alan is also the co-director of the Low Carbon Energy Center for Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Sequestration, three big and incredibly important topics that engage the talents of dozens of our faculty, researchers, and students. Alan, we're glad to have you at the helm. And speaking of the helm, the helm is yours. Good. Thanks very much for the generous introduction, Rob, and I'm very pleased here to discuss with you uh, the work that we have been doing in carbon capture. Let me share my screen with you and um, we can go ahead. What I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the area of carbon capture and some of the new, new uh, techniques and technology that we have been developing. So I don't think it's any surprise to you that uh, we carbon capture is a really important consideration nowadays because the CO2 emissions and the global temperature uh, changes um, uh, associated with the uh, CO2 emissions have led to dramatic increases in, in temperatures over the, uh, over the um, globe over the last 50 years or so. What we have is um, a very strong correlation between the actual temperature rises, it's been the anomaly, temperature anomaly since about 1880 has gone up by around over two degrees of Celsius, about two degrees Celsius at this point. And this is directly correlated with the amount of CO2 that has been uh, em emitted over this, this period and it's been accumulating in the atmosphere. So clearly there's a very strong correlation here. Something was predicted by Arrhenius around 120, 130 years ago and it is uh, still uh, part of our models right now. So the uh, problem we have is CO2 emissions from fossil fuels are a major contributor to the overall uh, CO2 budget in the atmosphere. And indeed, if we look at the United States energy concern, uh, emissions, the energy related CO2 emissions from fossil fuels is on the order of about six, uh, five to six uh, gigatons per year a significant amount of CO2 that's been going up into the atmosphere because of coal, natural gas, and petroleum type products. If you look at the overall emissions by sector, uh, the, the electricity sector is certainly a significant fraction, but so is the industrial sector and transportation provides a huge uh, uh, um, amount of CO2 that's emitted to the atmosphere. Globally, there's on the order of about 35 to 40 gigatons a year of CO2 that's been emitted. And these, of course, are all accumulated in the atmosphere to a large extent. And uh, it's a pretty important that we try and think about ways in which we can mitigate that. The uh, IPCC has, uh, and, and others have shown that the uh, CO2 emissions as a function of time will continue, as we go as business as usual, the CO2 emissions will continue to increase. 
uh, with time over here. And this would lead by the end turn of the century, a temperature rise of about four degrees Celsius, which is really unsustainable for human activities and for life on, on the planet. So there's a lot of interest in terms of how we can abate, the, uh, have what kind of abatement technologies, how can we mitigate these CO2 emissions to give us a, a, a opportunity to keep the temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what this means is that the CO2 emissions should be dramatically reduced over the period over the next uh, 80 years or so. And indeed, at some point, around about 2050 to 2070, we're going to need to have a net zero uh, emissions, which means that uh, we need to be able to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere rather than put it into the atmosphere. The mitigation patterns, can, the mitigation here can be achieved through a number of different approaches, and one of which I'll be talking about today is the carbon capture uh, utilization. Fossil fuels are always going to be an important consideration. Uh, we will not get away from fossil fuels completely, although we can reduce the use significantly as we get further and further electrification of our grid and things like that. Um, so we, the, this is the fossil fuels. This is the net negative amount of emissions we're going to need, and we can do that using uh, net uh, ne negative emission technologies, and we'll be talking somewhat about that. Um, the strategy for CO2 mitigation, clearly there's nuclear, there's solar, wind, and hydro, all of which are, are important uh, and are, are developing even further nowadays. And then there's a whole area of carbon capture utilization and storage. So nuclear, solar, wind, hydro, of course, avoid the emissions of CO2 at all, whereas the carbon capture utilization and storage actually try to do something with the CO2 that is being emitted nowadays, and we cannot avoid completely. And we can look at the capture, we can look at utilization, and we can look at storage cap capacities. In addition, this is to take into account what's happening at, uh, in terms of emissions, but we can also look at how can we remove the CO2 from the air directly, and this is where bioenergy with carbon capture sequestration is of, of interest. There's direct air capture, taking uh, CO2 directly out of the air, and then, of course, forestation, and these are all uh, removal of the CO2 from the atmosphere. The carbon capture center, our mission in the center is to conduct cutting edge research, we want to look at techno-economic assessments, and we want to reduce the cost of carbon capture. We want to enable secure carbon storage operations, uh, options and develop carbon utilization opportunities. So my work today is going to be talking a little bit more about the carbon capture side, because that is where my areas of interest have been over the last uh, few years. And in particular, of course, we have uh, the uh, power industry, we have the uh, industrial industry, then we have um, carbon capture, uh, carbon emissions from uh, vehicle transportation. These typically are in the range of about 5 to 15 percent CO2 in the emissions. On the other hand, the other areas in which we could be uh, of interest as well for CO2 abatement, some of which would not so, do much to solve our CO2 problems, uh, such as in confined spaces and submarines and aircraft and spacecraft and the like. Buildings, uh, if we can keep the CO2 levels down inside a building, we can then uh, avoid doing a lot of exchange of, of air outside to maintain low levels and uh, therefore re reduce the air conditioning costs associated with this. And then there's also the whole area of looking at capturing CO2 directly from air at the moment. A number of companies are looking at that right now. And these typically we're on the order of about 0.05 to uh, about 0.5% of CO2. So we can see that the scales over which we are looking at are enormous and the concentration ranges are pretty significant as well. And what we need is a suite of different types of chemical in, of, uh, technologies for mitigation of the CO2 uh, releases. So if you look at the carbon capture utilization and storage uh, space, uh, the source of CO2 is uh, power, is uh, coal and, and gas the power sector, the transport sectors, of course, and the industrial sector are all important sources of CO2. Whereas if we look at the storage side, uh, we look at sequestration and, geograph and geologic uh, formations. We look at useful sequestration, uh, such as enhanced oil recovery and mineralization. And we also look at utilization, such as the development of uh, chemicals and production of chemicals through either chemical or biological uh, means to be uh, used um, for so fuels or uh, ke uh, chemical products or fine chemicals and the like. The important part, of course, connecting these two is that we need to be able to capture the CO2. And here we look at uh, how can we go about doing this. 
Obviously, one of the ways we do it is to take a CO2-rich exhaust stream and pass it through an AD or absorber uh, system in which we remove the CO2 and then we release a lean CO2 stream. This is good because we can now capture the CO2 directly. The problem is the absorbent will tend to get uh, loaded up and we need to regenerate the absorbent and, uh, generate and release a pure CO2. So we take the CO2 rich absorbent and take it to a desorber where we have uh, some kind of energy input to be able to break the bonds or whatever it is that we have in the system and release the CO2 as a pure CO2 product that can then be sequestered or uh, utilized in other ways. Uh, and then we can take the lean sorbent and take it back to the absorber and uh, do this complete cycle. Now, there are a number of different ways we can do that, and I'm going to talk about a couple of new ways that we have been looking at that might be able to uh, be exploited to do this efficiently. Uh, the capture of CO2, the release of CO2, the desorption, can occur through uh, temperature swings, in other words, raising the temperature, breaking chemical bonds, pressure swings to release uh, uh, CO2 because of a sucking it out, basically, off the surface or off, out of the sorbent. And then we can also talk about electric, pit, electric uh, potential swings, which is of some interest, uh, significant interest to us. Now, if you look at the traditional aiming process, to put things in context, the traditional aiming process is the benchmark uh, operation. We have an absorber system here. This is where the CO2 gets absorbed by an aqueous solution of amines, in this particular case, one ethanol amine, and it uh, um, interacts with CO2 to form a chemical, a carbamate. The chemical complex is shown here. This is generally done at about 40 to 60 degrees C, so fairly low temperatures. But to be able to release the CO2 and regenerate the amine, what we need to do is take this up to much higher temperatures where we can break the chemical bond and form the, release the CO2 and regenerate the amines. This then takes is taken back from the desorber unit back through a heat exchanger where it cooled down again and sent back to the absorber. This whole process is rather energy intensive. It requires significant amounts of steam for the reboiler and the like. And uh, generally it requires a certain amount of uh, retrofitting and disruption of the steam cycle in a power plant if you want to install it in an existing power plant. So we were wondering, are there ways in which we can go about avoiding this uh, huge energy requirement, the steam requirement, and do things under more isothermal conditions, but also with um, using electrical sources, which uh, can uh, be uh, from uh, renewable resources as well. So the basic idea we have here is very similar in terms of the absorption side. And we have an absorption column in which we absorb CO2. We have the amines coming in. The CO2 is uh, then uh, captured by the amines to form the carbamate. But the difference is the way in which we regenerate these amines. Instead of sending this to a, a thermally uh, heated up uh, absorption, a desorption column, we send this to an electrochemical cell, as shown here, where we've got the, uh, uh, these are copper electrodes. And what we do is when we oxidize the, uh, the copper electrode, we release the cuprig ions, and these will complex with the amines very strongly, displacing the CO2. So CO2 comes off now as a pure stream, and we can then release that or disengage that in the flash tank. Then this copper amine complex that we have can now be taken back to the cathode, cathode chamber uh, of the electrochemical cell where we uh, plate out the copper and in so doing we regenerate the amines and send back can then be sent back to the absorption column. So this is a pretty straightforward process now and uh, the thing is that the anode chamber really takes the place of the uh, desorber, the thermal desorber, and the cathode chamber is more like the uh, and replaces the heat exchanger system that we have. Uh, this process works pretty well. Uh, this is a small uh, bench scale system that we uh, set up in our lab. You can see the desorber here. These are electrochemical cell uh, uh, with the uh, copper electrodes separated by a, a membrane. To, uh, the, the two chambers are separated by a membrane. Just to show you how this works, this is the applied current that we apply across that cell, and the, the, the higher the current, the greater the rate at which we release copper uh, ions to solution, and therefore the greater the rate at which we will release CO2. And indeed, as we change the, the uh, uh, current passing through the system, we change the amount of CO2 that's being released directly, as shown here. Typically, we can get on the order of 80 to 90% Faraday efficiency uh, for these systems. 
I'll see what happens is sometimes the, the well, sometimes the, the cathode, uh, the anode will be uh, corroded and the cathode will grow with time. And at some point we will need to flip chambers, uh, feed, uh, uh, change the polarity and feed the, uh, the, switch the feed to the different chambers. And this shows you the, the cyclic type operation is rather stable. This is on the order of six hours. We've actually run these on for more than 200 hours now and we've got very, very stable operation of these systems. So the question is, what are the thermodynamic energetics of something like this? We can develop the uh, thermodynamic program, uh, uh, diagram as shown here. This is the potential versus the 10 hydrogen electrode as a function of the amount of copper that's been released relative to the amines in solution. And we start out here, this is coming from the bottom of the absorption column. At, at a, a, a pressure of about 0.13, a fugacity of 0.13 for the uh, CO2. This is at a constant concentration here. We, uh, as we start releasing copper into the system, we also begin to start releasing CO2 and we get uh, a, a, at a constant pressure and we get the CO2 loading goes in this case from 0.81 to 0.26 in the system. Then when you get to the end here, um, we take this off to the flash tank and uh, we then re re recirculate the um, CO2 copper, uh, CO2 lean copper rich solution back to the uh, uh, cathode. We begin to reduce it. The concentration is constant the whole time of CO2 now, but as we release, reduce it, we're replacing out the copper and we come back in this cycle. And total energetics are basically given by the um, area under this curve. So that, that gives us the, the minimum thermodynamic uh, penalty. Of course, you have to worry about transport limitations and other kinds of kinetic uh, over potential required, et cetera. But once you've gone through and taken consideration of all these different kinds of uh, things, such as surface and transport over potential and so on, we can de work, uh, develop a, a, an analysis of the uh, work required to do this, the kilojoules, electrical, electrical equivalent, the kilojoules per mole of CO2. And we find that we are uh, very competitive with the other uh, systems that are out, the advanced MEA, the thermal EDA, advanced uh, uh, perusity. Uh, so this shows that basically the concept is a very viable concept in the system. And the economics are also favorable if you look at the cost of electricity. Um, this is for the EMR system, the process we've just been talking about with the MEA and NDA and piperazine uh, things. And we see that we are very, very compatible in terms of these. The overall capture cost is depends on the shift in loading that we have in copper. How much of a capacity do we utilize of our, our system? And uh, if you go between about 40 and 80 percent, you see that the loadings of the actual capture costs are pretty reasonable depending on the price of the membrane, the cost of the membrane that we have in the system. But that seems very, very promising in this case. So just to summarize then, I've given you a very brief overview here. There's a lot more that's gone into it, in particular in terms of understanding the chemistry associated with these systems, electrochemistry and the like. But the advantages of that process that we foresee that for this is it does not need steam and extensive retrofitting, which is a very strong advantage. It's really much of a plug and play type operation. It can be operated isothermally, which is also a significant advantage. We can dissolve at pressure to some extent. And if we want to, we can also utilize low grade heat to improve the efficiency, but it's not, not crucial. And it certainly has competitive costs and energy requirements. Now, what we do here is uh, the actual the, the agent that captures the CO2, the amines, um, are not really a, a electrochemically active at all. What we do is we realize the electrochemistry of copper to add to the amine solution to release the CO2. There are other ways in which we can do this and actually have the chemical reaction, the reagent itself, be uh, electrochemically active, so we don't have to add a second component to the system. And then one of these would be looking at quinone type systems. There are a number of different systems we can look at. But this particular case, let's think about the benzo, well, quinone systems in general, as shown here. Typically, these in the dormant state have no capacity for CO2. They're just uh, pretty uh, inactive. We can then, if we go through an electrochemical reduction, add a couple of electrons to this guy. What you'll find is the electrons accumulate on the uh, oxygen here. We've got various highly high electronic densities associated with this, which makes it a very active uh, state for the capture of uh, electrophiles such as CO2, which will form the dicarbonate as uh, shown in this case 
So this is a way in which we can then modulate, control the capture of the CO2 by controlling the electronic uh, distribution on the, um, on the molecules by uh, reduction. Uh, and then when these are fully loaded, we can regenerate them by oxidizing these again, removing those electrons, oxidizing, going back to the dormant state, which has no particular affinity for CO2 whatsoever, and we can release the CO2 in a flash tank, and release the CO2, and then recycle these uh, systems. The question, how do we actually apply these in, in a case of one in, in a real system? The idea we have here is to use an adsorption type process, not absorption, but adsorption, in which we'll have electrodes as shown here in a column, as we in, a, in a chamber like this. The CO2 will be flowing between the electrodes, and the electrodes would be functionalized with these quinone type molecules, where they would then capture the CO2 as they uh, pass through this electrode stack, and so on. So again, we've got the quinones coming in. This is the methoquinone coming in. It basically is uh, reduced capture the CO2, and then when, uh, when you want to, we can release the CO2 by reoxidizing the system. The way in which we set this up is shown here, a sandwich type structure where we have uh, the CO2 and this particular, well, you've got the pink ones here are the quinones in the reduced state, and they can then capture the CO2. We do need a, an electron source, of course, and we had that in the central electrode, which with this particular case is ferrocene. And uh, when you have a ferrocene uh, being oxidized to provide the electrons for the reduction of the, C of the quinones, uh, we get the ferrocenium. So at some point, this uh, electrode will now become fully uh, loaded with CO2, will have no, no more capacity for CO2. In that case, we can just reverse the polarity, and uh, the, the ferrocenes now get reduced Ferrocenium get reduced back to ferrocene. The quinone, these dianine quinones, get uh, oxidized back to the quinone and then release the CO2. So this is a typical swing type process that we'll have in this system. So let's just have a look at what we have to do here. One of the things, obviously, is that um, we want to have some degree of, uh, of a coupling between the uh, uh, coupling, redox coupling between the cathode and, and the anode uh, sections. And we want to make sure there's some charge balancing in the system. So let's take a look at the electrochemistry here. Um, if you look at the charge concentration on each of the electrodes and then the bound CO2 concentration on the cathode as a function of the potential relative to some reference potential, we know that the um, uh, according to the Nernst equation, we can relate the amount, the quantity of the charged uh, amount to the actual applied potential, relative to the standard state potential here, and uh, we'll get a curve that looks something like this. So this will tell us as we change the potential, make it more positive, the amount of charge on the system goes down, and the amount of CO2 that's bound also goes down. So you need to go to fairly negative charges here to be able to capture uh, the CO2. On the other hand, we have the, uh, the anode side in which we have the ferrocenes get charged up, and they have the opposite behavior in terms of the overall structure of the curve. So this really gives indication then of the electrochemical uh, advantages of the system. So if we apply a potential here, and uh, we capture the CO2, apply potential at this point, the amount of CO2 bound would be given by this quantity at this point. But because we need to have a charge balance, the electrons have to come somewhere to give us their charge concentration, we have the same kind, same charge concentration on the, on the ferrocene electrodes as well. And this then gives us the capture velocity potential. When we actually capture voltage, the cell voltage, when you apply a voltage across the two electrodes, this is what you would need to get this level of charge transfer and uh, CO2 uh, uh, binding to the electrodes. Then when you want to release, of course, we can apply a different voltage. And when you get to the different voltage, we get this would be the voltage that we would require to give us a bound concentration at about this level. So the total concentration swing, you might say, in terms of the, um, the CO2 that's captured and released is given by the difference between these two points over here. So how do we make these electrodes? Well, the the easiest way to do them, not the easiest way, but one of the ways is to take the polyvinyl ferrocene as shown here, and we wrap these around carbon nanotubes in solution, and uh, then do drop casting or uh, dip coating or things like that to be able to generate the uh, electrodes. 
This is the, the electrodes, the carbon fiber substrate for the electrodes. These are the actual uh, polyvinyl ferrocene carbon nanotube uh, uh, films are shown here. This scale bar is 200 microns. If you zoom in a little bit closer, we've got 400 nanometer scale bar here. You can see it's a very porous structure. You can see all the, uh, the um, uh, carbon nanotubes here. These are coated with the ferrocene, so you get very large surface areas and uh, large porosities, which is good from a number of perspectives. The uh, carbon nanotubes themselves ensure strong electronic conductivity. The uh, high porosity facilitates a ionic conductivity because you have these electrodes uh, imbibed with uh, an ionic liquid. And uh, the large surface area is really makes them readily accessible to adsorbates such as CO2 in this case. We can do the same with the uh, quinone electrodes, a very similar kind of uh, operation. We just uh, uh, do a polymerization of these anthraquinones and um, coat them in the same way and get very similar behavior. Now, the way we, some early tests we did were to take the electrodes, and this is the electrode structure. This would be the quinone electrode and the second quinone electrode and the ferrocene electrode in the center. These are separated by a separator, sandwiched together like this, and then they are moistened with an ionic liquid as the uh, electrolyte for the system. It also acts as a, a shuttle for the uh, CO2, allows the CO2 to be absorbed and then transferred directly to the uh, electrodes themselves. We then take this, elec this electrode, wind it up, and put it inside a sealed chamber, as shown here. Uh, we wind it up there, have the electrical contacts where we can do, connect the two, two different electrodes, and the sealed chamber is then connected to a pressure transducer where we can measure any changes in pressure because of changes in CO2 concentration in the gas phase. We seal everything up, pressurize this with CO2 at any given concentration, and then uh, flip this, uh, the potential on and off to get an idea of uh, how much CO2 is absorbed. We have to say we measure the, the pressure from the ideal gas stock and calculate the amount of CO2 absorbed and therefore uh, determine the effectiveness of this approach. This will show you what happens in this particular case. As we show here, let's just say in this case, we. Uh, we going, we're going from the oxidized to the reduced state of the quinone, and we'll see that when the oxidized, you get little, low concentration of CO2 um, on the electrodes, the amount absorbed, and when we go up to the reduced state, it gets absorbed pretty quickly and it goes back and forth. And we can see the cyclic efficiency is pretty good in a case like this. So we can go back and forth. We just fluctuated back and forth in terms of the, uh, the um, oxidation reduction potentials. The overall capacity was pretty high, the normalized capacity over about 7,000 cycles. There was some reduction in capacity, um, which was because of certain, we, we understand why that is, and we know how to improve on that. But the important part is that we got about a greater than 90% Faradaic efficiency, and as I'll point out a little bit later, we got about 40 to 50 kilojoules per mole, which is a very respectable energetic penalty to pay for this overall capture and release uh, cycle. We've also done this in packed bed type operations. Uh, this shows a normalized concentration in a packed bed. We have a packed bed like this. We have a CO2 rich feed and uh, we measure the outlet concentration. This is the normalized, normalized concentration outlet over the inlet as a function of the number of bed volumes. Bed volumes is equal to the actual time of the experiment relative to the residence time within the bed. And what we'll notice is that initially the CO2 has been absorbed, so the, what's leaving the, the, the column here is a, a very low CO2 concentration until such time as the bed is totally saturated with at that particular uh, concentration, and therefore the concentration of the effluent is uh, rises to be up to the feed concentration. And as expected, you'll see for different concentrations of CO2 in the system, we will get different uh, overall uh, residence times required for uh, saturation. And if we look at the normalized, this, everything falls onto one, uh, one um, curve here. And this gives us an indication then of the total bed capacity and how effective it is these things are in terms of capturing CO2. Here's just some other examples. This particular case is a, a residual concentration coming through, which we think was just because of poor hydraulics, hydrodynamics in the system and uh, in, in, inefficient packing of the electrodes. We have been able to do it where the actual concentration leaving the collar, leaving the bed, is uh, zero essentially for a large number of bed volumes before we get breakthrough in the system. 
So the actual the the energy utilization of a system like this is related to the charge transferred and of course the Faradaic efficiency about 0.9, and then the flux to the uh, difference between the capture and release uh, voltages in the system. So if you look at this, uh, we we talked first about the capture and release voltages as I talked about before. Now, this is the amount of CO2 released if we have this degree of uh, th these uh, capture and release uh, voltages. If we actually have a, a slightly more negative release voltage, what we'll have is uh, this degree of uh, with, with this particular voltage and um, the amount of CO2 released would be given by this. So you remember the difference between the capture and release voltages. So we can see in this particular case, the capture and release voltages are significantly smaller. The difference is smaller than in this particular case, if we use the uh, yellow uh, release voltage. But the amount of CO2 released is also less. But we can then evaluate from this the uh, amount of uh, uh, the release, well, the energetics associated with the system. If we look at the amount of fraction released as a function of the release cell voltage, in other words, the, uh, the, the capture and, and uh, the difference between the capture and release, the capture voltage 1.3, the release cell voltage can change. We get delta V of 0.3, we get about a 55, 60% fraction released, but we also get significantly lower energetics associated with the, um, with the overall capture and release cycle. There's about uh, 35 kilojoules per mole. So this is very, very encouraging, and all depends on how much of a capacity we want to utilize all the chronons as to what the energetics per CO2 would, would be. Um, so this is a very encouraging uh, result as well. And indeed, if you look at the overall summary of these systems, what we've got uh, in a chemical swing, they are isothermal. There's no electric external heat sources. They have a plug and play. It can be really easily installed. They're readily scalable. They can be used at small scale and large scale type systems with ease. The favorable energetics, about a gigajoule electric per ton of CO2, and the reasonable economics, uh, we estimate of the order 40 to 80 tons per CO2. This is actually for looking at direct air capture. The number seems really low for 80 tons per CO2, $80 per CO2, but uh, we need to look into that a little bit more closely. And it's also available across multiple scales. So. Now, we actually have started up a company to look at this, a company called Verdox that um, started not the best time to start a company in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, it is uh, getting uh, up and going, looking at a number of different types of uh, uh, market opportunities. For the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd like to talk to you about another system that we've been looking at and revisit the whole idea of what these uh, different uh, uh, capture scenarios might be. We know there are temperature swing. We've talked about chemical solvents, such as the amines for temperature swing type operations. There are pressure swing, which I've not talked about. These use physical absorption at high pressure into solvents, but then the low pressure to regenerate the solvents. And then we've talked about our two electrochemical uh, potential swing um, uh, systems here. We have others we've been looking at as well. These are all operated low temperature, ambient temperature. The question is, are we able to operate at high temperature? Are the actual operation in which we might be more advantageous to operate at high temperature, uh, at the temperature which the CO2 uh, is actually produced, rather than having to cool the, the uh, effluent gases down to low temperatures for use in these other systems? So why do we want to use high temperature intermediate temperature capture? If you look at take the fuel and oxidant, this would be the reactor. We take the hot exhaust, we get heat recovery from here, and we then take the cool exhaust, send to the sorber, and uh, we get our CO2 lean, and we get a CO2 product from the desorber. On the other hand, if we switch these and did the absorption and desorption at the high temperatures at which they produced, and then taking the hot exhaust gas and the hot CO2 going to heat recovery units, we can then get the same product eventually out at the other end. And the reason why this could be of interest to use high temperature recovery is that we get the energy content of the fuel coming in here. We get useful energy to extract it from the heat recovery unit. And then uh, some of that energy needs for regeneration, but that is then going to be wasted, it's going to be low grade energy that's somewhat wasted at this particular point. On the other hand, if we look at the energy content coming in again, we do the energy for regeneration at the high temperature 
and the recovered energy is of, of high quality and it can then be go to the heat recovery unit and we get useful energy coming out right at the end. Similarly, from the desorber, uh, uh, the useful energy from both the, uh, the lean exhaust and the CO2 product can both uh, be uh, recovered rather effectively for the system. How do we go about actually exploiting something like this? Uh, but we need, uh, well, we think we might have improved heat recovery, higher efficiency, and lower cost is the uh, holy grail here. The traditional solvents for CO2 capture um, of, of a very big valley. And here, this is CO2 uptake in terms of millimoles per gram as a function of temperature. And these are traditional uh, absorbents that people have been talking about. But we can see there's a very big trough, a very big valley in this region here. And this is the region in which we, we would be most interested in looking. So what we've been doing then is the high temperature or, or intermediate temperature carbon capture. Uh, for temperature swing, we have been looking at solid oxides. I won't talk about them now, but we have some significant impact, uh, uh, significant results on, on using solid oxides, such as magnesium oxide and the like, that show some very strong, powerful um, recyclability and um, capacities for these systems. We're also looking at metal oxides at the moment for electrochemical systems, but that is very, very preliminary work, and we don't have much to say on that at the moment. But what we're interested in, the um, high temperature systems. This is just showing that we are looking at uh, magnesium oxide, which we've overcome some of the many limitations that people have had in the past by having a molten alkali metal nitrate as a promoter for the CO2 capture and the formation of the magnesium carbonate in this particular case. Uh, we're not the only people. Other people have also been looking at this. But the important part is that we are able to operate rather um, stably over many, many cycles as shown here. And what we've done is by having the promoter here, we can actually bring the, the CO2, we can overcome many of the kinetic limitations associated with CO2 capture and bring it up to looking at the equilibrium curve associated with this. We need limit, limited by equilibrium rather than uh, kinetics in the system. But what we're interested in again now is other systems that we might be able to use. These are solid oxides that we've talked about in the past. But we also be recognized that we can reuse molten oxide system that can have some significant advantages in terms of being able to be, um, well, we'll show you some of the advantages in a while. Uh, so there are two different types of molten oxide we've been looking at. One is a liquid to solid in which CO2, when it gets captured, it forms solid products. The other liquid to liquid, CO2, when it gets captured, it stays as, a, as a dissolved in the uh, liquid uh, as molten oxides. These, these molten solvents have good advantages in terms of reactivity with rapid kinetic stability and uh, are able to remove contaminants simultaneously and uh, be able to separate them, such as uh, SOX and NOX. They can operate under isothermal conditions or pressure swings, uh, and isothermal conditions with uh, isothermal pressure swings, and they can also be uh, highly efficient uh, in use of uh, reaction and sorption enhanced designs. Just to show you quickly some results in these, this is a liquid to solid type system. This is the loading as a function of time when we challenge these uh, solvents with that. And we'll see that depending on the concentration, whatever happens, there's always this little knee that's coming in here. We get a fairly quick absorption rate and then a bit of a knee. And at this particular point, the solvent is becoming saturated with uh, CO2, but you're also getting nucleation and formation of particles as shown here. And once that occurs, that keeps on driving up the CO2 up to a total loading of an order of six millimoles per gram, which is pretty a respectable loading. If you're looking at the liquid to liquid systems, we do not see that need. We get much more stable, a much more attractive uh, iso uh, um, kinetic results as shown here. But it does indicate that we are able to get really good uh, loadings at uh, fairly low uh, rates of absorption in these systems. So the stability, let me show the stability for these two systems that they uh, cycled over many, many cycles, these 100 cycle uh, tests. And we can see that there's very, there's definitely no loss in uh, overall capacity over this time. They're very stable in these operations. Uh, we're able to regenerate these isothermally uh, using steam. So we have an inlet concentration CO2 coming in. This is when we capture it. And we have a sweep gas coming out uh, steam in this particular case to release the CO2 
uh, into a, a steam stream. This is all done isothermally, and we can see that we get very rapid uh, capture and release of the CO2 from these systems. And it is uh, the, the uh, purity of the release of CO2 is 100%. The capture is a pretty about 90% capture in these cases, and we've got many, many cycles of our stable operation. So if you just want to revisit this uh, up, uh, system here, what we've got is, again, a little value of death, you might say, in terms of the uh, existing uh, absorbent systems, but we have been able to fill in this gap quite successfully, looking at a magnesium oxide system, lithium borate, these are solid systems, and uh, two different types of liquid systems, either sodium or lithium sodium borates that can operate in these particular temperature ranges. So we have been quite uh, happy with the results to date. The question is, how, how effective are these going to be in terms of uh, actual applications? This is just one analysis we've done, looking at uh, utilizing these in a coal-fired power plant, uh, an analysis. Uh, what we have is a typical coal-fired power plant with the um, the SCR and the um, FGD here, and uh, all the other things that go on. And what we look at is the, uh, this will be the combustion is, this is a steam cycle. But we can, if we can integrate these um, absorption systems in with the, uh, in the boiler and the like, we can do a fair amount of work in terms of looking at the sulfur recovery, a CO2 capture release, and, and so on. So this is with capture. And uh, the question is, is this going to be a, a viable approach economically? So let's take a look. We've done a fairly, fairly detailed aspen analysis, design analysis on the systems. This is the efficiency, red efficiency of the power plant. This is the emissions uh, in, in kilograms CO2 per megawatt hour. If you have no capture, the emissions are pretty high, efficiency about 46%. Uh, if we have a capture, the net rate efficiency is going to be about 33%, and uh, we get about 80 90% capture, and the emissions are greatly reduced. If we use our molten salt systems, according to our analysis, we get this range over here. These are various cases we've looked at, uh, where the emissions level uh, are, about, are similar uh, to what we have for the amines but the efficiency of the overall plant would be uh, larger, would be significantly uh, better. And if you look at this as being the base case here, we can then uh, use that and do an uh, analysis around that base case. Um, and the question is, uh, how does this compare in terms of costs? This is the cost of CO2 avoided using traditional amines on the order of about $50, $55 per tonne. Uh, an efficiency, again, of about 34 in this particular case, 34%. Our base case, as we pointed out before, was close to 40% efficiency, and this is there, but the costs are somewhat higher in terms of the CO2 avoided in this case. So by doing an analysis of a number of different uh, combinations, whatever, we end up with this type of uh, curve as shown here. And the, a relative to the base case. And the important part is that we have now been able to minimize the cost at, at some, some loss in, in overall efficiency, but not a really huge loss in overall efficiency. And it looks like this could be a very viable approach uh, for us uh, to adopt. Uh, take the economic analysis. Uh, the levelized cost of electricity shows with amines, it just up, goes up by about 64%. With the molten solvents, we think it could be up to about 40%, significantly low about. And the cost of CO2 avoided would be uh, shown here, um, $55 per ton relative to $34 per ton, around about a 38% uh, decrease in, in cost of CO2 avoided. Of course, there's a lot of work still to be done in this case, uh, the materials of construction, um, the stability and things like that. But this uh, rather extensive, exhaustive analysis here indicates there could be some strong advantages associated with using um, these molten salt absorbents. So pulling all together, the uh, these advantages of the molten solvents is rapid kinetics and high capacities. They're inherently stable and, and uh, regenerable. They are they uh, can ca co-capture other gases if needed. Uh, can be regenerated by a pressure swing or a temperature swing, depending on how we want to go about doing it. And the high temperatures can lead to improved heat recovery in these systems. 
So to summarize, we've looked at a range of different op options here for new technologies for CO2 capture. Uh, primary area has been in red active species, chemically mediated systems, um, in which we looked at a number of different approaches. I just described two today that look promising for overall CO2 capture. We also have uh, solid oxide, which I've not really talked about. Um, and then what we have introduced very recently are these molten salts uh, as, uh, as absorbent. Nice part about the molten salts is that we can then consider combining the, the, uh, uh, the um, advantages of uh, continuous type processing. So we can have the, uh, the uh, absorbent going from the absorber to the desorber uh, in a continuous way. So we do not have to worry about the uh, normal switching and the cyclic uh, swings that one needs with uh, solid phase absorbent systems. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and I certainly would like to acknowledge the students that and postdocs that have done the work on the, over the last uh, five to ten years or so. Mark Stern uh, developed the EMAR process uh, that has been really greatly improved by the others shown here, and uh, Saad Voskin was very much involved with the um, uh, electrochemical system. And I do not have Cameron Halliday here. Cameron Halliday and Takriya Harida, I forgot to put them on are two that worked very extensively on the molten salts and have brought us to the point where I think it's actually a, a very viable approach. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in, um, which, which we'll get to. Um, and maybe we should start with those. And, and they're rather specific, but we can move maybe to more uh, general questions. I don't know if you can see them, Alan. If not, I'm happy to read them. I'm trying to get my stop share here. There we are. <laughs> there are questions. The, the first relates to NOx and SOx impact on quinone absorption. Okay, that's a, a very good question. Um, NOx and SOx. We haven't done much work with NOx, but we have done a fair amount of work with SOx. Um, Obviously, the socks are going to bind quite strongly to the quinones, and uh, if you've got a low concentration of socks, they can be absorbed, and we can tolerate that for a while until the, uh, enough of the quinone has been poisoned, as not we losing significant capacity for CO2. At that point, we can just uh, take it to a much higher oxidation state and release the socks in a separate, we can take it, take it offline and release the socks. Alternatively, this is something we have shown, although we haven't published this yet, um, we can actually alter the quinones themselves to make them much less uh, basic. And um, so they will absorb the SOX quite effectively without actually taking up the CO2. So I think that's a really important consideration in this case. And uh, so, yes, uh, we are able to um, ac accommodate these as well. Uh, the, same, the same questioner asks, um the same question about molten salts. Ah, the molten salts, yes. Um, again, what we find is with the SOX, uh, I'm not sure what happens with the NOx. Well, there are two different things that happen there. The SOX, um, what we find is that they tend to precipitate out. So the liquid molten salts, lithium, uh, lithium sodium borate, with the CO2 as a liquid phase, but the SOX will tend to precipitate out. So one can, in principle, then take that off and have a purge stream to uh, uh, capture, to regenerate the SOX site. And uh, it just, uh, that can be accommodated. The NOx, we have a different situation, and the NOx actually end up going in there, and we end up getting volatilization, um, and, and we can lose some of the sorbent. So that could be a bit of a problem that we need to address still. Does, does, does that, the potential for, for taking up SOX and OX in the same reactor uh, mean that if a, if a plant didn't uh, have, have uh, SOX and OX abatement equipment attached to it already, as it might not in many developing countries, that, that this becomes a way to provide both and, and therefore to lower the cost of, of scrubbing all the gases, including CO2? Yes. Um, what we have is, uh, in the power plant one I showed you, although the other thing as well, power plant, we did have that built into that the schematic I showed you in which you would have the, the socks being removed as well directly along with the CO2 and generated uh, and regenerated separately in a, in a side stream. 
I should point out that the uh, the socks problem is actually quite an important issue you know, for the Cronones and things like that in the maritime industries, where there's uh, the new uh, new uh, regulations in terms of socks emissions. And I think that uh, our system could be quite effective there for minimizing the overall costs associated with the, uh -huh. the, um, the systems, yeah. Joel Powell asks about um, integration with gas-fired versus coal-fired plants. Um, yeah, there basically we're talking about uh, the different concentration levels of CO2. I should see no reason why they should not uh, be just as effective. We are busy doing some work now. I know that uh, Cameron is doing some analysis of gas-fired systems. He also did analysis of uh, cement industry and so on. So we should have those numbers in the next uh, month or two. Particularly now, he can't spend any time in the lab. He's got all the time in the world to spend doing economic analyses. It's a great time to be a TEA guy. Yeah. Um, have you been able to move toward a real life demonstration projects with these devices? I, mean, I, I know that you've got Verdox going, you seem to me the most well, likely. Verdox is certainly moving towards doing that. Um, in fact, that, that is their goal. We have been, and uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we will have units out there, small units initially, uh, but, but not necessarily for looking at uh, the large scale mitigation, but certainly for some direct air capture and then utilizing the CO2 there for uh, various things like greenhouses and things like that, very good demonstration units. But we will uh, hopefully in the next few years be in a position where we can sort of do some very large scale type operations too. As far as the EMR process is concerned, we have been working with a company in terms of developing, assessing whether this would be something they'd want to put on, on board uh, on one of their um, pilot plant facilities. The molten salts, that's really too new at this point. There's a lot of, of, of unknowns um, in terms of the uh, metals, uh, materials compatibility and so on. We think we're overcoming some of those issues, but we need to, we need more experiments, which uh, we are doing at the moment. We would be doing if we weren't at home. If you investigated the, the techno-economics of air capture with any of these techniques? Uh, yes. Um, I can't say much about that, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> that, that was done uh, during the uh, fundraising stage for the I see. investment stage. And I, 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 it was done in a separate uh, study. But it, it does look very, very promising. Uh, I, then I, I must admit I find the numbers a little low. I'm a little surprised at how low the numbers are relative to what other technologies are, but uh, I have every faith in the people that did it. So maybe we're okay. Low in the sense that the, the costs are low or low in the efficacy? The, the overall cost per ton of uh, CO2 captured. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. Uh, Joe also asks about the stability of the quinone system. By the way. Uh, another good question. Um, clearly, the, the quinone systems can, uh, depending on the oxygen content and, and things like that, there are some issues associated with the oxygen reduction. Um, but we feel that we can obviate these problems by uh, modulating or changing the structure of the quinone so that the oxidation or reduction potentials are significantly more positive and we can avoid some of the oxygen reduction systems, uh, oxygen reduction problems, yeah. I see. Um, I think we've gotten to all the questions. Well, there was one other one about whether you properly accounted for the power consumption uh, in the EMAR process uh, with the... Uh, uh, the energy spent on, on the electromigration of ions between the electrodes. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's all been taken into consideration. That, that really is what, what's been uh, brought, brought into that, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for the questions that have come in. Keep them coming if you, if you have more. Uh, just perhaps one more. Um, that, that I, I see much. there's one here. How does moisture interact with these adsorbents? Ah, oh, yes, right, good. Yeah. Um, with the quinone type systems, uh, because it's very low moisture content in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the electrolyte we have, the ionic liquid electrolyte, has very low water content. And so we do not have much of an impact of, um, of, of uh, water on, on the quinones at all. We don't see any, any impact there. We've actually also worked with quinone-type systems in the water and salt 
kind of electrode system. So rather than using ionic liquids, we've used water in salt, a very strong lithium salt, and uh, shown just to be as effective using the quinines for CO2 capture. Mm -hmm. uh, with the molten salts, um, we don't see any, any, any effect of water whatsoever at this point. Uh, of course, uh, there may be some other things we haven't seen yet, and, but we'll have to wait and look and get more experiments done. Now, we, we did that uh, regeneration, the steam regeneration of the molten salts, and um, we saw the cyclic stability was pretty remarkable. Hmm. I guess, finally, a question relative to, to your center. Uh, I understand that you've initiated a, a seed fund call that, that sounded to me rather unique. I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about where you're, where you're heading. Sure. Um, what we had initially is uh, a seed fund. We gave small grants to some of our, particularly our junior faculty members to get them into the, uh, interested in the whole area to try and bring them in to be with the center. Um, this has been fine, but we kind of felt it would be worthwhile now and that the um, center members would get a lot more out of it if we had some large projects that we're running instead. So we had a seed fund call. We had 15 proposals or white papers come in. And um, of those, we selected three for full proposals. And by the end of uh, May, we will have uh, will have them down to figure out um, who we're going to give the, uh, the award to. We've got some very exciting proposals, I must admit. Oh, and, and is that all entirely funded from the seed contributions that members have already yeah. made, or did it raise more? Yeah, those will be from the seed fund, yes. Oh, that's exciting. Great. Yeah. Um, I guess with that, uh, well, there's one more question that's come in, and it's absolutely timely. Will the slides be posted and available to members? Right. Our usual answer to that is yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I I I'll clean up a couple. Take back all my 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 backup slides and things like that, and get rid of it. Perhaps that's that's an invitation to to wrap up. I guess with one further uh, thought. Uh, in in our past experiences, um, participants have uh, had questions occur to them after the phone has been hung up, and uh, they've emailed them to us, and we've passed them on. Um, so I hope you won't mind answering a few more questions if they come in that way, uh, Alan, um, and we'll Not post, problem. Not problem post those questions and answers uh, on the site, along with the recording of this, uh, this session uh, within the next couple of days. Alan, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, a really, really interesting talk and, and one that I think is exciting and uh, should inspire everyone. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you all for joining, uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye.